Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, for many years, I had the schus, the merit to sit and listen to one of the great rabbis of the previous generation, passed away just a few years ago, of Moshe Shapiro, Zeichat Tzadlik, the College of the Bracha. It's difficult to, certainly not my place to, in any way uh, be magdir, to define or to be able to describe his greatness. But his influence was so pervasive and so ubiquitous amongst the Baal Tshuva world in terms of teaching, revealing depths of Torah. I'll just open with one small uh, anecdote which I heard from the person who was actually there at this event. So, as you know, that uh, Neve Yerushalayim is a girls' school, the sister school, so to speak, for Or Sameach. Really has a very similar, started off anyway, very similar profile, but for ladies, for girls who some of them didn't come from a very strong Torah background or no Torah background who wanted to explore Torah. And of course, every year they have a Hanukkah Misiba, a Hanukkah party. And at the Hanukkah party, apart from lots of latkes and donuts, there's lots of Torah. And uh, each one of the rabbis, I don't know how many rabbis there were, probably nine and up, would uh, stand up and would say a little, maybe not so little for some of them, piece of Torah, an idea about Hanukkah. And each one of them got up and said his piece and sat down. And the Menahelet, the... Um, how do you say, the director, the female, the lady director of the whole program at the end stood up and she said, girls, you know, it's amazing. We've heard so many, so many divrei Torah here tonight. But, you know, we have to remember at the end of the day, it's all one Torah. And some girl, some bright spark in the back of the room shouted out, yes, Ramos Shapiro's Torah. <laughs> Meaning almost all, virtually all of the teachers there were his Talmidim. It's uh, an amusing story, but it really, I think, uh, goes a long way to encapsulating. What I'm going to do tonight, Bezrat Hashem, is to try, with my extremely limited ability, to give over one of his, one of his shirim um, on Pasha's chukas. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically use the notes of Rav Daniel Baron. Uh, Reb Daniel is a Talmud Chochem who sat for many years taking notes of Reb Moshe's Shirim and uh, distributing them. And uh, I'm working from his notes and the footnotes that he has are absolutely um, invaluable. They're fantastic. Um, so I'm, that's what we're going to be do tonight. If you want to have a copy of what I'm basically going to be teaching, Rezat Hashem, you could send me an email yasinclair at gmail.com and Bezrat Hashem, I'll send you, send you the, the shir in English. However, if your Hebrew is good, what I would recommend you to do, if you enjoy the ideas presented tonight, is to go online, you can, or on the telephone, to um, what's it called, the Koladaf, where Rav Moshe Shapiro's shirim are stored. And I believe this is Pasha's Chukas, Tov Shin Ayin Gimel. And that you'll be able to hear the original Shia. If your Hebrew's up to that, for sure, there's no way you can compare with the original. Being as it may, with Hashem's help, as much as I'm able to, I'd like to try and give over some of the ideas that Rav Moshe Seichat Sadalev Rocha presented. The Mishnah Burra mentions that this Friday coming, Erev Chukas, there is the minhag of certain Yechidim, certain individuals on a high spiritual level to fast on Erev Shabbos. Now, fasting on Erev Shabbos is something that um, I have to say, I, I will be making comments which weren't Reb Moshe, so you know, there's some, there's not, not everything I'm saying was pure Reb Moshe, but um, anyway, just to add a little um, clarification, to fast on Erev Shabbos is a very serious thing. It's not something we do lightly. In fact, there's only, one part, there's only one fast in the whole year that can fall out on Erev Shabbos, apart from this fast, which of course is not a public fast. 
and that is Sarah Batavis, the 10th of Tevis. Every other fast in the year, the calculator is uh, arranged, it's calculated in such, a mas- in such a fashion that it cannot fall out. No fast, not even Yom Kippur, falls out on Ere Shabbos, on Friday. And the reason is clear because we don't want to diminish the kavod, the honor of Shabbos, by going into Shabbos in, in a state, state, state of quasi-starvation. I mean, not, you know, it's not, but to, it's not the kavod Shabbos to go into, of course, a person not allowed to go into Shabbos stuffed to the gills. He's supposed to have an appetite. But on the other hand, to, feel, to go into Shabbos in this state is not considered to be kavod Shabbos. Why the exception of Asara Batevis? So, parenthetically, that is because even though Asara Batevis ostensibly, of all the fasts that we, we use to commemorate the destruction of Beis Amikdosh, was the least significant. Nothing happened on Asara Batevis. No shot was fired, nobody died, nothing. What happened? Yerushalayim was put in Matzor or Matzok, under siege and confinement. One of the ideas that maybe we can understand why that's so severe is that's the moment at which, even though it wasn't the end, it was the beginning of the end. At that moment, so to speak, the final pieces in the jigsaw for the destruction of the Beis Amikdosh locked into place. From that point onward, it was, maybe one could call it, a foregone conclusion. And the beginning of the Tchilas of Peronos, the beginning of the punishment is the most severe, the most if you want, if you like, maybe you could take a mashal, a parable of, of an acorn. Everything that the oak will ever be is there right now in the acorn. You can't see it, but right now it's there. And right now, right then on the Sarabatevas, that was basically the entire churban was contained with what happened on the Sarabatevas. Okay, that's a side. Bar. Now, we're talking about a fast which is not a public fast, a past, fast at certain individuals. And again, it's on Erev Shabbos, so we can understand. The reason I went di- digressed there was to show you that we don't fast on Erev Shabbos very likely. Now, what is it that we are commemorating? So, there was a terrible, terrible decree on Erev Shabbos, Pasha's Chukas, in the Middle Ages where 20 wagons full of Sfarim, almost all of the Gemaras that were in Europe were burnt in France. It's something, a tragedy that nowadays we can't even really have any uh, uh, appreciation of. Nowadays it's become, the printed word is so ubiquitous, uh, the non-printed word, now, you know, access to text is just something we don't even think about. But that, that, that was basically all of the Torah learning in Europe. It was a terrible tragedy because in a, in a sense it was, we lost the Torah. And it took many, many, many years. Torah learning took a tremendous hit. And the Kolbo, who's a Rishon, and other early commentaries explained that there was a revelation that the burning was connected in some way with that day. It wasn't by chance that the burning of the Torah in medieval France was Erev Shabbos Pasha's Chukas. Onkelos, the Aramaic translation of the Torah, translates the words Zos Chukas HaTorah, which are the first words of the Torah, of the Pasha. Zos, this is the Chuk, Chuk, the law. Of course, the word Chuk, we have to understand. A Chuk is a law which we can't understand any logical reason for, reason for. There are three kinds of Jewish laws. There are mishpatim, there are eidut, and there are chukim. And eidut is like a sign, like Shabbos, a sign of our belief in HaKadosh Baruch Hu and our trust in Hashem. Tfilin is an ot, is a sign. There are mishpatim, all of the laws of torts, of hilche uh, shcheinim, how people are supposed to behave with one, one another. Those are what, what are called mishpatim. Chukim are those laws which are supernatural, which we don't understand them. But the onkelos translates Zos Chukas Torah as not just this is the, the, ch- the chukim of the Torah, which of course we're going to talk about Paraduma, the red heifer, in a second, but he translated this was the decree 
against the Torah. This was the decree on the Torah. Zos chukas Torah. He translates that, that says, as ze da gezeras oraisa. Da gezeras oraisa. The gezera on the Torah. Meaning, alluding, hinting to, in that, on that day and in that generation of medieval Europe, that the Torah in some way was destroyed. Khalilim. So therefore, people fast on that day because, of course, as we understand, Ramchal says it in several places, that every day, that every, every, every Jewish commemoration, there's a reawakening of that particular hashpa'ah, that particular current of energy that comes down from upstairs. So, let's try and understand this. First of all, the placing of the Zos Chukas HaToyra, this Pasha of, is of the, of the, 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 the mitzvah of the Para Aduma. Briefly, the Para Aduma is a way whereby somebody who's become Tomei Meis, impure, spiritually impure, I'm not talking about physical impurity, spiritually impure from having contact with the dead body, which we're going to discuss in a moment, this was a way for him to be able to achieve purity again. Tahara. Tuma means impurity, Tahara means purity. He was able to achieve this through the midst of the Paraduma, which basically required the ashes of the, the, the red heifer and some water, and other elements which are basically mixed, mixed together and sprinkled on him. We're not going to go into the details now. But through this, he achieved Tahara. Purity. Why was it that these laws are found at the end of Bamidba, which is where we are now, towards the end of Bamidba? Now, if you think about it, this was just where the Jewish people had reached Arvos Moab, the plains of Moab, on the border of the land of Israel, and they were about to go into the land of Israel. But chronologically, the first part of Duma was burned within a year of Yitzhiz Mitzrayim. A year after they came out of Egypt, that was the first Paraduma on the 2nd of Nisan, because the Mishkan was erected on the first day of Nisan, and Nadav and Avihu, if you remember the story, died on that very day in the Mishkan. And the Mishkan itself may have been considered Tomei. So all the utensils present then became Tomei, and there was a need to immediately purify them. So basically, this Pasha that we learn that the end of Pasha's Bamidbar, just before they went into Eretz Yisrael, was really given much earlier at, at Mara. Why does the Torah mention the laws of Paraduma, of Tum, Tum of Atara, here, towards the end of the Torah? So, some introduction is necessary to understand this. Let's go into this idea of Tuma and Tahara. Basic laws, for example, depending on the level of tuma of impurity, a person is restricted from his entering further and further into the center of the Jewish camp. For example, a matzora. Matzora is somebody who develops a, a skin disease which is mistranslated as leprosy. It's not leprosy. It's some kind of spiritual disease which registered on the flesh a spiritual malaise within. He is for, his forbidden even from entering Machane Yisrael. Machane Yisrael, which is the general encampment of the Jewish people. A Zav, somebody who has a, an irregular uh, emission from his body, cannot in, uh, enter Machane Levia, which is uh, further inside the camp of the Levites. The Machane Shechina, uh, where the, the Mishkan was the center, those who are Tomei Meis, they cannot go in there, but they can go into the other camps. So what, that's just, what is, what is Tuma? What is Tuma? And what does the word Tame really mean? Of course, it's translated in English, English as impure, but as usual, English words are totally inadequate to convey the concept of Tuma. So the word Tuma comes from the root Tet Mem. Tet Mem. For example, the word Tum Tum. Tum-tum is basically 
Tetmem, Tetmem twice. A tumtum is someone who his sexual uh, identity is, uh, is not clear from the outside, meaning he has a membrane of skin which covers the area of the gender in his body. The word, why tum tum? Because the word tum tam means to be covered. Tame means that something which is opaque, covered. Tamun means hidden in Hebrew. Another satum means sealed, similar word. I've often thought actually the word in Hebrew, the word in English rather for a, a tomb may come from satum, which means sealed. I don't know, that's conjecture. Anyway, the, that's so something which is, uh, tame is something which is sealed, is inaccessible to us, is sealed off. There's, 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 a, there's, a, there's a, how do you say, it's opaque. There's, there's a barrier there. That's the idea of something which is tame. Now, on the other hand, something which is taho is to do with clarity. Tsohoraim, it's from the same root, is the clearest time of the day. The most open part of the Mizbe of the uh, of the Mizbeach in the Beis Hamikdash was called the Tohoro Shel Mizbeach. Right in the middle of the Mizbeach, right in the middle of the day, Tahara is the opposite of Tumtum, of, 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 of which is a Tame, Tam, sealed. It's open. It's transparent. <clears throat> As we said, Tuma closes, conceals. The main reason that the Torah is concealed from us is because we are all, to this day, because we've lost the ability to purify ourselves, from the Av, Avi Avos HaTuma, the grandfather literally, the root, the foundation of all, the source of all Tuma, which is Tumas Meis. Impurity, which comes from a dead body. This is the most severe tumor, and it's the one which is therefore matamtem, seals off to the greatest degree. Anyone who is tame may spreads tumor and causes everything around him to become tame. A garment that he touches becomes an ava tumor. He himself is an av avia tumor. But again, it goes down one generation. Something he touches is an ava tumor. And some people, some opinions hold even an avi avasa tumor. Therefore, because all of us are Tame Mace, we therefore are on a very low level. Our Tuma becomes an insensitivity, an iron partition between us and reality as it really is. There's a posseg which says in um, Sefer Devarim, Ru'u ata. See now, ki ani anihu, that I, I am he. Ve'en lalokim imodi, there is no God with me. Ani omis, I will kill. Ve'achaye, and I will bring back to life. Mochatzti, I have struck down. Ve'ani erpo, and I will heal. <coughs> the word here, mochatzti, mochatzti, I have struck down can be read, read in Hebrew, it's the, because there are no vowels in the Torah, obviously, as mechitzati. Mechitzati, my partition, my division, my iron barrier, erpa, I will heal. Let's explain this. Why is a dead body the thing which is most sealing off? If you've ever been in the presence of a dead body, you'll know that it seems like the end. Nothing is more final. Nothing is more shocking. Nothing brings us to a clear realization of our fragility than being in the presence of a dead body. We do not see beyond. We cannot see the connection. It looks like an iron barrier. That's the end. This is the greatest tumor, the greatest ceiling, the greatest... Concealment. Mechatzati, mechatzti, anier pa Hashem eventually will heal that division. He'll take away that division and we will see how the life carries on. 
in the in the world to come. We intuit how weak, how unstable we are, as it says in the Pasuk in Tehillim, Ketzel Yomenu, like the shadow of our days, a fleeting shadow. When one comes into contact with the dead, that Mechitza, Mechitzati, Mechatzti, descends and separates us from the source of life. That Mechitza is constantly renewed and it makes us tame, sealed, sealed off. And therefore we come, become increasingly distant. The mechitza becomes progressively thicker, more impenetrable, and keeps us away from a bond to reality as it truly is, from our connection to life, because it says, Ki imcho mekorchaim. With you, Hashem, mekorchaim is the source of life. And we're divorced, separated from that source. Okay, so what we said so far is, theoretically, the mitzvah of Poraduma, which is to purify from contact with death, should have been given at the time when the, the Mishkan was erected in the temple, because that's, in point of fact, the first, that's when the mitzvah was given, and that was the first time it was used. What's it doing at the end of Sefer Bar Midbar? We've got that question in abeyance. Let's not lose that. Now, there's something else which helps us understand this, the severity of uh, this tumor, the idea of what the para udum was all about, and of course linking it back to this idea of why we fast, or some yechidim fast on Erev Shabbos, Pashas, Chukas. The Maral explains, when talking about that the Maraglim, the spies, the sin of the spies, was the, what they effected was basically the separation of Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, of the Exodus, to the going into Eretz Israel. Ideally, there should have been one generation. The same generation that left Eretz Israel should have been the same people who went in, sorry, the same people who left Eretz Mitzrayim, who left the land of Egypt, should have been the same people that went into Eretz Israel. They weren't. It was a different generation. There was an iron barrier, so to speak, because of the sin of the spies and the necessity for all of that generation to die in the wilderness. There was a disconnect in the Torah. We should have left Mitzrayim and gone directly to where it's Israel. And there's a discussion in the Gemara whether the Dor Hamidbar, the generation that came out from Mitzrayim, actually went even into Olam Abba. So severe was that mistake. It's a Gemara in Sanhedrin. Now, let's not make a mistake. Even though the Yotze Mitzrayim, the generation that came out from Egypt, made a tremendous mistake and were barred forever, they died in the wilderness, but let's not make any mistake as to the level of their greatness. There's a famous um, stories about uh, a certain Taya in Bava, Bava Basra. Many stories about um, Rabba Baba Khana who encounters this, ish, this, this basically this Arab, a Taya, who takes him all around and shows him, uh, Taya literally means a wanderer. And the Rashbam understands him to be a Ishmaeli a merchant who was Ishmaeli, someone who dwells in the desert outside settled areas, who was familiar with all the things that the desert contains. And he says, come and I will show you the dead of the desert, said the wanderer. Now, in this vision that this Tayash showed Rabbi Baba Khana, he saw that the generation of the Yotzim Mitzrayim, those who came out of Egypt, appeared ecstatic, as if drunk, sleeping on their, bank, on their backs, with their faces uplifted. The knee of one of them was raised, which is a posture common to one lying on his back, and the space under his knee formed a triangle. And to show how very large that person was, the taya, above his, sitting on top of his canal, with his spear uplifted to the maximum degree, rode under the knee of this, one of these people who came up from Mitzrayim. And it didn't even touch the knee. 
This was to indicate the statue, stature of this person. Now, obviously, the story contains a message. Let's try and understand it. The morale says that the tzura, the human tzura, the picture, the form, stature of a person begins with the knee. That is where the person's stature begins. He brings a halacha that says, the Gemara Chulin says that if a person's leg is missing from the knee down, he's not considered to be a trefer. But if, the, if it's from there and up, so he has all the dinim of someone who is a trefer and will not live out the year. What do we learn from this? That the beginning of a person's stature, that's where he's supposed, so to speak, that's where he becomes a person. He has tzuras odom, starts from the knee. The knee bent meant that the tayar, even while elevated on his camel to the maximum that he could be with his spear raised high, the maximum he could extend himself, didn't reach to the knee of the dead of the Dora Midbar. Meaning, the Gemara is saying that how great those people were that even Rabbi Barbachana, one of the Talmidim of Rav and Rabbi Yochanan, didn't even reach to their stature. He could not even begin to reach the, their Tsurasa Adam, their picture, their Dumus, their. In other words, the morale is teaching us that the, even of the appearance of these people is beyond us. They are so lofty, so removed from us. The point is that we shouldn't think that because they made the mis- this mistake and they were they died in the desert, let's make no mistake, their entire level of spirituality was something so be- beyond what anything we can even possibly imagine. Yeah. The generation of, the, of Mith- that left Mith- Mitzrayim received the Torah, but, so to speak, the Torah, as it was given to them, died with them. While we are the disciples, the Talmidim of Moshe Rabbeinu, we are not his direct disciples. We only are his disciples through Yeshua. Yeshua was the, and Kolev were the only survivors of that generation. That division between the two generations, we said, dealt us a tremendous blow. So, I'm having to be mekatseha a little bit. We need to understand that a terrible tragedy occurred, as we said, and the Torah itself mourns those who received it, but who did not merit to fulfill it properly. The Dora Midbar, the generation that came out of Egypt, were the recipients of the Torah, but they were not the ones who were able to fulfill the Torah to live the Torah in its full sense. They are, so to speak, outside the camp. They're not with us. The death of the Dora Midbar meant that they did not connect to the order of the generations of the Jewish people. They're not part of that Nasaira. They're very, very great, but they're cut off from us. We cannot learn anything from them. It's impossible to take anything from them. No aspect of that contact that they had reached to Eretz Yisrael. So with this background, we can understand the placement of Pasha's Pora and the laws of Tumantara at the end of Sefer Bamidmah. The conclusion of Bamidmah marks the end of that generation. That is when they died. The Ramban explains that in Devarim, Moshe addressed those who would enter the land. When Moshe, Devarim, which is really with Mishnah Torah, the repetition of the Torah, was to that generation. It wasn't addressed to the generation <coughs> of the Otsim Mitzrayim. Therefore, the book of Bamidbar, so to speak, is the end. It would seal the end of those who left Mitzrayim, and Devarim, Ash, Devarim ushers, a new, ushers in a new era of those who had entered the land. Let's... Um, Let's go, uh, uh, this is an interesting idea, a get. A get is a divorce doc- document. A get is written, has to comprise of 12 lines. So Tosfus, citing Rabbeinu Tam, explains that this is because the gematria, 
the numerical equivalent of the word get is 12. Tosfos also cites the Ri in the name of Reb Chai Goin or Reb Sadia Goin, who explained that the number 12 corresponds to the total number of lines which separate each of the five Chumashim of the Torah. Since each Chumash is separated from the next, from the previous one, by four lines. A get implements separation, and therefore it corresponds to that number. Now, notably, the four lines between the end of Bar Midbar and the beginning of the Rahim are not included in that count, because if it were, there would be 16. In a sense, therefore, why is that? Because Bar Midbar, in a certain way, is the end of the Torah. A get, therefore, has 12 lines corresponding to the three sets of spaces between the first four books and not 16 lines, which would have included the spaces before Devorim. In other words, this emphasizes the closing of Bamidba as the conclusion of the Torah in a certain sense. We mentioned that the Mechitza between Us and Ha Sinai was the death of the Dora Midba. This was a death which defiled us all, which created an iron partition, an iron wall, which blocks us from connecting to the source of the Torah from Matan Torah itself. We were there only through the people who remained in the desert and they died, and death separated us between those and those who received the Torah. The root of Tuma, as we said before, is death itself, the thing which separates. The Pasha talks of the death of the true Tzuras Adam of the Jewish people, as we said, that the true Tzuras Adam, which was the level of as we remember the dream of Rabbi Baba, the, the vision of Rabbi Baba Khan and the Taya, that stature of Tzura Sa'odam. Therefore, the Torah waits to reveal the mitzvah of Par Aduma, which is the means by which a person is purified from this separation, from this mechitza, from this division of death, until the death of the Dora Midbar. The death of that generation represents the greatest mechitza between the source of life, ki emechom kochaim, and us. And yet, specifically, and logically, if you think about it, it's here in Zos Chukas HaToyrah, this week's Pasha, that we learn how to counter the mechitza, which separates us from the source of life, the mechitza which clogs our hearts and closes our eyes. There's a famous Rashi right at the beginning of the Pasha on the first line. Rashi quotes a Chazal who say that the Satan and the Uma Sa'olam, the nations of the world, challenge us. They, they, they uh, not tease us, they, 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 how do you say, they scorn. And they say, what is the reason, what reason can there be in the Pora Duma? You know, you take this cow, you burn it, you mix it with some water and other stuff and pff, pop, you know, Bob's your ankle, there you go, you're pure. I mean, what's going on here? And it's a claim that we, we don't just ignore their scorn. We take the claim seriously. And on account of it, the Torah calls the paraduma a chukah, a decree that we're not permitted to question. That's what the answer is. We say, we say to them, the paraduma is a chukah. We say that to the nations of the olam, nations of the world, to the satan, how does that answer their challenge? What becomes easier or clearer as a result of saying, yeah, it's a hook. We're not allowed to permission or question. On the contrary, one can expect that the southern the nations to persist in their challenge once we admit there is no reason. They say that there's no reason to it, and we answer that we, we give them an answer. Yes, there's no reason to it. It's a hook. Well, what went on? What was the question? What was the answer? What? Okay, we don't have the ability to grasp the real reasons for mitzvahs. When we talk about a tam, a reason of a mitzvah, the word tam in Hebrew also means taste. The very, very, very best we can do is to get a, a taste. Just like when you eat food, you're not sustained by the taste. The Hashem makes food tasty. Why? Because if it wasn't tasty, people wouldn't eat. And if we didn't eat, we wouldn't survive. Similarly, a Jew needs mitzvahs in order to survive. Ki heim chayenu. That is our, quite literally, our bread of life, spiritually. 
And therefore, we have certain tamim of the Torah to make the Torah more attractive, make us, make us want to do the mitzvahs. But they're only tamim. They are not the nutrition itself. We don't have the ability to grasp the real reason for mitzvahs. The true tam, the true reason for the mitzvahs, is their reward. And there's no reward in this world. And we think we spoke about this in previous occasions and we don't really have the time to go into it now. But it's not scha mitzvah mitzvah. The reward for the mitzvah is the mitzvah itself. And scha mitzvah by high al malaika. There's no reward for a mitzvah in this world. When we get to Olam Abba, all the mitzvahs that we do, scha mitzvah mitzvah, the reward for the mitzvah is the mitzvah will be that Olam Abba will be a revelation on a true level in all its depth of the action that we performed. Right now when we do mitzvahs, they are tasteless. Now, I'm not going to say when a person puts on tefillin in the morning that he doesn't feel he's doing something right. He does. He feels, he feels good. Why does he feel good? Because I know intellectually I'm doing the right thing. But does he feel the mitzvah? No. He's putting a leather box on. He's shaking a piece of wood. There's no pleasure from that. And yet, in Olam Abba, this will reveal the greatest unbelievable pleasure which we quite literally have no way of experiencing in this world. We have no means to grasp the simply unbelievable bliss that exists in every mitzvah. So when they ask us for reasons, you, that's, we have nothing to answer them because nothing in their system of tastes, in their, in their chocolate box, in any way will correspond to this pleasure. There's nothing that they can possibly understand. However, yet there is one thing to which we can connect, and this lie, in herein lies the secret, which is the chukas of the Torah, and the key to overcoming the stigma of Tumas Mace, of the impurity, the sealment of Tumas Mace, which, is your, which is, gives us the ability to break through this barrier. Zos Chukas Torah. The question is asked, why did it say Zos Chukas Torah? This is the Chok, the decree of the Torah. It would have made more sense to say this says Zos Chukas HaPorah. This is the Chok of the Pora Aduma. Or Zos Chukas Ha. Atuma, zos chukas hatara, zos chukas hatoira. The word chuka, chok, is connected to the word chokek, which means to engrave. There's a difference between something where, for example, there's ink which writes on parchment. The words, the ink, the message, so to speak, and the medium, the parchment, are separate. When we talk about something which is engraved, which is chokek, which is a chok, the message becomes part of the medium. There's no difference. When you engrave something, the message becomes inseparable from what you've engraved it into. Ink Parchment, the two are distinct. They remain distinct. The Torah was not written, was not written on Taluchos. It was engraved, chiseled into them. And the, the message is that we similarly need to engrave the Torah into our hearts, meaning that we have to become one with the Torah. In our daily brachas on the Torah, we say, V'chayo olam nota b'sochenu. And Hashem has planted everlasting life within us. Something which is planted becomes one with the ground, just as something engraved becomes one with the tablet onto which it is engraved. Although, as I said before, we cannot process, we cannot relate in any way to the tam, the taste, of the pleasure associated with mitzvahs. There's no time in this world. There's nothing in the chocolate box of this world which will give us the barest hint of the taste of a mitzvah and olam abba. But we can fuse those mitzvahs. We can become part of them. Fuse ourselves to the Torah. 
כי הם חיינו. They are our life. The heart, when we ask to, the Torah says that we should write upon Luach Libecha. The Luach Libecha. A Luach is a tablet. As we said before, when you write on a tablet, you don't use ink, you engrave it. The Torah has to be engraved into our heart, so our heart and the Torah becomes one. The Torah says, Im b'chukosai te'lechu. Im b'chukosai te'lechu. If you go in my chukim. It's not enough for us to fulfill what's command, us commanded us. We need to make it part of us. One and the same. And this is the only way that we can escape that mechitza of death. And that's why the Torah says, Zez chukos ha-Torah and not zukos ha-Para. Our connecting to Torah has to be in this manner to become one with, and it's only through this means that we can receive a taste of Chaya Olam, the life which transcend, transcends this life. There's a positive in Tehillim which says, Hu Yannigenu Al Mus. He will lead us Al Mus, Al Mus. Can be translated as forever. Chazal see this as a reference to Al Moves, to death. Above, sorry, not to, above, Al above death, he will lead us to something which is above death. Hashem leads us to a life which is al the opposite of death. The Gemara says that one who toils in this world, his Torah toils for him somewhere else. It's, um, it's in Sanhedrin. Amr Rabbi Yitzhak Bar Abdimi, my crush, and I'm a nefesh omal amala lo. When somebody toils in Torah, toils, he works hard. It's not easy. But when he toils in Torah, the Torah works for him. The Torah works for him. The greatest blow, just to sum up what we said tonight, the greatest blow that the Torah itself endured was the loss of the Dora Midbar the generation of the Exodus, those who received the Torah firsthand. They were supposed to be the beginning of that Masorah, to go into Eretz Israel. They didn't. One can't imagine the depth of the Torah's mourning over the generation that received the Torah and died. They departed from that order, that Seder, that Masorah. They're no longer connected to us. The Torah reveals that Tumas Meis, the Tuma that comes from death specifically, where does it reveal this in this week's Pasha? Specifically at the closure of that generation, when that generation is now passing on. And the new generation, the generation of Devarim, is now going to take the stage and will be the progenitors of the rest of the Jewish people. The reason is because it is here that the Torah revealed the great blow to the Torah. Zos Chukas HaTorah, as Uncle is translated, we said at the beginning of the year, Da Gezeris Arisa. This was the decree on the Torah, against the Torah. We live in a, an, an era and in a society, especially us living here in Eretz Israel, where we see that a large part of our misguided brethren, brothers and sisters have completely lost, are so completely satum, so completely sealed, so completely separated from the Torah. It's up to us. We are the ones that have to make the Torah. Ksav v'luach libecho. Write it on the luach of your heart. Write it. Engrave it. Don't write it. Engrave it. This is the means to escape the Gezeira. And the message is found in the same words, Zos Chukas Torah. We escape Tumas Mace, that iron partition f- through fusing ourselves to Torah, engraving it into ourselves, becoming one with it. And this brings us back to Chaye Olam, which was blocked by the Mechitza of death. The Torah first tells of 
process of tahara, the process of Torah para aduma, and on its, all its details, only after it teaches the rules of Tumas Meis. Why? The answer is, is, in many cases we see this, that the solution precedes the problem. Kodesh Baruch Hu is makdim, the refuah, the maka. Hashem gave us the Torah from the outset to infuse us with chaye olam, as we say in the bracha. Hashem also learned the Torah as emes, v'chaye olam no ta v'sochinu. Just like we said, the plant fuses with the ground we have to fuse ourselves with the Torah, make, it, make ourselves one with the Torah, not just fulfill the Torah, live the Torah, be the Torah. Those words, those of the Torah, therefore represent both the degree to which the Torah was subjected, the Gezeira the Orisa, the Gezeira on the Torah, the mourning of the Torah that it lost its original recipients, those who were supposed to transfer it to Eretz Israel and on, but it also gives us the means to bring back, back Chaya Olam and that tra- transcendent state of Almus, above death. We can connect to the Chaya Olam of Torah, everlasting loss of Torah, only if we grasp and establish in ourselves the fact that Torah is carved into ourselves. It's part of us. It's carved It's connected to our very essential life, and we have to uncover that. It's like words engraved onto rock, into rock, into rock. And although that part of ourselves may be very covered covered over with all the shtuyot, all the nonsense that goes down in this day and age in which we live, those of us, Baruch Hashem, who have made it to a place like Or Sameach, have this opportunity to peel away all of those coverings, and to discover in our hearts how the Torah is engraved there. Da Gezeris Oraisa. That is the reason why there are those very high spiritual person, Yechidim, who will fast this Friday. One who cares about this, if you care about this, and you see the Torah as life, not just part of your life, if you see Kiheim Chayenu, then at least on this Friday, it should be a day of prayer and contemplation, a day of commitment to a new, a deeper connection to Torah. May Hashem help us and all of those who make efforts to connect themselves to the Chok, the engraving of the Torah into our hearts. Thank you. Thank you.